I'm sorry, Dad. It won't happen again. Okay. Where are you, by the way? Study group. Ah, whose house are you at? Uh, one of my friends in bio. You haven't met her yet. It won't happen again. Where are you, by the way? That's a different shot than that. See, that's a different shot. Oh, okay. There was a cut on her. So there was a jump there. cut there, yeah. Yeah, there, there's another cut. The lighting even changed on her, but you never catch it. No. <laughs> I'm giving away everything right now. <laughs> I'm Margo. I haven't been able to reach Margo. When was the last time you saw her? The study group only went till nine. How do you cut a thriller? I think we're gonna go late. No, she definitely left at nine. How do you keep a firm grip on the narrative? Did she mention anything unusual? Was she acting strange? Where are you? She's been transferring funds for the last six months. How do you trick the audience, but give them everything they need to figure it out for themselves? She had cash in her car. She felt bad about everything. She was my best friend. Oh my God. She told me she ran away! I didn't know her. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm What's Nick. Will. In this video, I'm meeting Nick and Will, editors of the new hit thriller Searching, that won Sundance, is making 70 million at the box office, and is now coming to video on demand and streaming. I'm calling to report a missing person. I wanted to find out what it takes to edit a thriller. This video is brought to you by Music Vine. Get six high end music tracks free by clicking the link in the video description. John Cho plays a father who, when his 16-year-old daughter Margot goes missing, has to try and help find her uh, with the only way he can help with the investigation, which is looking through her laptop and her, her digital like social media life. And while he's doing that, he realizes he maybe didn't know her as well as he thought he did. What's up with the FaceTime? Oh, I'm glad you asked. What is wrong with this picture? I'm about to be in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> maybe we should keep the trash in your room? It's a somewhat conventional detective thriller just told in a, a totally new, bold way. Yeah. You usually don't want to play with the form and the genre at the same time. Right. Yeah. And you're playing with the form quite a bit. A lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah what we're... is that form? The entire thing takes place on screens, mostly on computer screens on Margot's laptop, which is not necessarily a new concept. We've seen like open windows and Unfriended is the most successful. But all of these films, this is a little bit nitpicky, but they do this thing where uh, they're kind of afraid to, to just cut and to treat the screen cinematically and I mean we would have been too if, if they hadn't <laughs> done that first let's talk a little bit about the moving across the screen yeah like yeah, you're yeah. taking control of the audience yeah. eyes mm -hmm. what's the thinking behind that that's what movies do she's good though yeah what do you ask making sure you guys are both talking to each other both they'll do don't forget the trash and then we'll go over and grab his line Everything's fine, Peter. Thanks for asking. And that sort of coverage is more the filmmakers showing you what you want to see um, and kind of presenting it in a more cinematic way rather than just following the mouse and just seeing what David is yeah. doing. But like deep down, it's exactly the same thinking as like, you know, there's like a doorknob and then it turns and like a shadow comes into the room yeah. and you see like a gun in their hand. Like it's just trying to cover the scene in the most interesting way you can. Yeah. The live action shoot was 16 days, something like that, yeah. But the edit, as we said, was, was pretty well over a year. So a lot on the editing side of things. This is pretty much what our project looked like. You can see this is all just one big long nest with cut points in them. Can you explain nest for me? What? Yeah, so what a nest is, it's basically like a compound uh, clip that you know you can step into. And then inside, this is what it looks like in our nests. Wow. You could isolate each one of these like, for instance, you know, if I turn all these off, you, j you have the desktop background. I can turn off, for instance, the weather page there or um, the YouTube video. So basically the way we constructed this was we would create everything in a wide, kind of like this. We highlighted all of our live action footage in this teal color. This video is David right there. Mm -hmm. And this video is Peter. And one thing you'll notice with that actually, you, you would think like we're doing this in a computer screen, so you know we're just kind of dropping the best takes in there. But if you look at it, it's full of cuts. Right. Like you can see, this is where we created all these glitches, right? Oh, so okay. we would kind of like add freeze frame parts of it, 
and just create that stuttering kind of effect that you get. Would you use the distortion as a cut point? Yeah, occasionally we would if we needed to combine takes or we really more used it as a timing thing. If we wanted to create more of a pause or if, yeah. or if they were taking too long and we needed to cut some air out. Hey, uh, I gotta go, but send me that recipe, please. Thank you. Yep. Both feeds were actually the actors talking to each other in real life. Like, you still want to do some take selection and playing around with it. A lot of times you wouldn't want to use the same take anyways, you know. Maybe Peter's performance is more what we're going for, but David's performance isn't. So then we would have to combine those takes and then timing would be an issue. It won't happen again. Where are you, buddy? That's a different shot than the, see, that's a different shot. Oh, okay. He's going in slow motion for a while there, and then he plays back. Very obvious cut on her right there. Interesting. So you had to pace it out more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, these camera angles, that's not shot with a webcam, right? You, no. It's basically a red or whatever. Oh, wait, the, the, the live action footage of them? That's yeah. GoPros. That's GoPros? Our okay. DP, Sebastian, really wanted everything to look super real. Okay. And then we'll add the layer of cinematic on, on you know, in this part of it. Okay. Um, but yeah, they were just GoPros. In terms of how we actually broke up the work, we just divided the movie into 26 sections, which we later found out is what Pixar does. Oh, interesting. And then we each just kind of took one at a time, uh, and by the end of the movie, we'd both worked on uh, every section. So we, we kind of filled in for whatever each other's shortcomings or strengths are or whatever. What was the dynamic with the director having two editors? Were there alliances sometimes, or how did It was always work? us against him. <laughs> Originally, we were in a room where there was a dividing door. We were constantly um, maximizing uh, Anish, Seven, and Natalie's time because um, while they were working with somebody else, one of the other editors was implementing their notes. Before we move on to the next stage, I want to take a brief moment to thank Musicvine for their support. All music tracks used in this video come from their awesome library. And Musicvine is offering you six free tracks for personal use, vlogs, podcasts, or indie channels of up to 500,000 subscribers. So sign up by clicking the link in the video description and also get a 20% discount coupon for a potential future purchase. Musicvine in general has instituted a new and flexible pricing structure to accommodate your film or video needs. And the license starts at eight bucks per track. Now back to Nick and Will. All the graphics were rough. We came in, we cut in Premiere, and we picture locked. We brought everything using Dynamic Link over to After Effects. You know, half of this process uh, was actually in After Effects. It wasn't just in Premiere. So if editing took, you know, six months, then the After Effects portion took about six months. Yeah. You can see now we've replaced all of these with Illustrator files. So the graphics are much crisper. If we go to, for instance, this shot, which we saw earlier, where it was all messy, now it's nice and clean. Okay, so let's just make a point of that. So you did not screen record a Mac at all. You decided We started that it. way when we were first roughing out what the movie would be, but the final movie is completely built from scratch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why it took so long. And yeah. it was because of quality or because of control? Because you so. can see, yeah, because of control, like we had to replace all of the copy all of the text, all of the thumbnail images, all of that stuff. So we would have been doing a lot of manual work anyway. Oh, I have a good control thing actually. This, what David's about to do here. Sorry, Nick. He's about to right click this and he's going to go to a thing that says hide from search results. Yes. Just we made exist. that up. That's not that real. Exist. For a split so second, I was like, what? You can do that? <laughs> I'm not sure why you would ever want to do that, actually. Yeah. But, it, but works. it works in the movie, and people don't, most people don't really question it. That's um, awesome. So this is what a typical After Effects project would look like for, for search. And it's broken down by all the 26 sections. So if I were to go into this pre-comp, this is, <laughs> this is what a pre-comp would look like. And they go deep, they go many levels deep. And you can see we've replaced all of these with Illustrator files. What's the reason of doing these layers in Illustrator oh, as opposed to question. Photoshop? Yeah. So Illustrator is vector-based, so what that affords you is the ability to uh, punch in as much as possible. In Photoshop, when you blew that up, it would be really distorted, but in Illustrator, you can zoom in and, and the lines and everything stay nice and crisp. I love that we get to see, like, he wants to type something and then he changes his mind. Yeah, a lot of that nice little first person stuff you get to see with these computer screen movies. As you get back. Right. 
Oh, one more thing. I want to know about the final you <laughs> took today. What's great with computer screen movies is that you can kind of see these really quiet, intimate moments of a character alone on a computer. Kind of see this little deeper emotional part of David's life. Yeah. yeah. So, how do you edit a thriller? <laughs> what does it take to edit a thriller? You gotta like thrillers. That's good. For me, what a thriller is about is making sure that it's never dragging, that it, the story is streamlined and that one thing leads to another and that you're keeping the tension um, high. I think the script was already incredible and then what we did in editing was we um, just made sure that the plot was always, always moving forward. Did she say where she was going? Not really. How'd she look? Was she worried? Did she look scared? Was she talking? Honestly, I don't know. We're not really that close. Why did you invite her to study group? However, I think not being afraid of pauses, I mean, this is like, every editor says this, but, but just, you know, not being afraid to let things breathe when they need to breathe is very crucial, especially when tension is a big part of the story. I think our, our first cut was way, way too fast. Um, and even though our runtime came down because we cut unnecessary scenes, uh, every scene individually probably got a lot longer in the final movie. Okay, you were, you were in her class though. Did she mention anything unusual going on lately? Was she acting strange? Uh... Any advice for aspiring editors? From a purely functional level, it's probably good to learn After Effects and stuff like that. I know like editors far along in their career hate me for saying that, but yeah. that helped us. Um, uh, Specifically for thriller editing, any advice? Be emotional about it. Be like, you know, like, like think about the actors, not just like the software, and, and like look into their eyes and really like feel the takes. Watch them full screen, don't watch them in some tiny little window, um, and, and watch movies in theaters. And, and just re like get deep into it, like really focus all your attention onto the performance they're giving, I think, yeah. So what does it feel like to look at this movie now after the fact? Um, now that it's up? Nothing, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've just seen it so many times. How do, you, how do you deal with it, that like as an editor, after cutting it and recutting it, recutting it, you're like emotionally dead and you still have to make it better? Watching it with audiences really helps. So when we would test it on an audience and you see their reaction, you remember your initial feeling. You really got to try and hold on to that and, and trust each other as a team as well because say there'll be moments that uh, Nick will remember the emotional core of that I wouldn't remember and vice versa. Uh, but I really think like watching it with a friend or an audience is a great way to refresh your, your mind about what the scene is trying to do and what the movie is trying to do. Yeah, getting those mirror neurons fired up again. Yeah. yeah. I want to thank Nick and Will for letting me shadow them and give us a deep dive into their process. They also answered a bunch of questions directly asked by the patrons of This Guy Edits. The next question comes from Bryce. What do you do if you've edited something a particular way and it's just not working? Well, first, you don't try to convince yourself or anyone else that it's working. Clara would like to know, what excited you about editing a screen movie? You guys were credited as editors and director of virtual photography. What is virtual photography exactly? What is it like to go to Sundance and what can you do as an editor when you're at the festival to like get the Ooh. next gig? I feel like we failed at that, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked out for us anyway. <laughs> so this was our first Sundance. Check out the answers on patreon.com slash thisguyedits. A big thank you also to Sony, Basilev Production and especially Alex Anderson who made this happen. Searching is available now on video on demand and streaming, and now also on Blu-ray. If you've seen the film already, do let me know in the comments what you think about the storytelling, but no spoilers, please. Don't forget to check out Music Vine for your free tracks, and if you like this video, there's another one I made with Josh Beale, who cut on House of Cards, Bloodline and Counterpart. Very late in the process, I presented an idea of playing the shot on Howard. Permission to fire. Take the shot. No, no, stop! There's a lot of stuff going on, right? There are different locations oh, okay. of action, right? You have like up in the balcony, you have down.